So, the first YouTube algorithm secret, I call it the new channel boost. Essentially, unofficially, YouTube is trying to compete with TikTok. Now, something TikTok do very well, especially in the beginning, in the beginning, when a new account is created and posts a bunch of videos, TikTok makes sure to give those videos an extra amount of impressions and views to inspire that new creator to continue posting content. And as of this year, me and a lot of my YouTuber mates have been noticing YouTube doing a similar thing. For example, this channel, Nate Wealth, if we come back and look at his first couple of uploads, 200,000 views on his first video, 89,000 views on his second video, but then fourth video, 150,000 views. Fifth video, 360,000 views. Sixth video, 140, then 130, then 150. That's pretty good. Pretty insane results, especially considering a lot of the topics Nate was covering, especially in these two videos, were like how to record voiceovers for YouTube videos, which typically, in my experience, aren't super hot topics in the YouTube education space. Now, not to take anything away from Nate's success, his videos were very good, but this channel was started right at the peak of this YouTube new channel boost thing that's been happening happening. Because for example, if we come up and look at some of the newer videos on the channel, very few of them have got anywhere close to where his original videos are. In fact, he's only had two videos get over 100,000 views out of his last 14 videos. And I don't think this is necessarily his fault. His videos are just as good, if not better quality than some of his earlier ones. It's just that his channel boost has kind of worn off. And I've seen this happen on so many channels now. So if you've been grinding away on your channel for a couple of years, you've been struggling, your older content isn't very good, but the new content you're starting to put out is, something you could try would be creating a new channel and just posting your new good content on that and see if you can trigger this new channel boost thing YouTube's doing. But if you don't take advantage of this in the right way, like most people, you're not going to get many views. So the next algorithm secret I want to share with you is going to help you do that. So I've jumped over to my trusty digital whiteboard here. This is where the fun begins. That will sort of help to illustrate a thing called collaborative filtering. So let's say that you post a YouTube video and let's say this is your Minecraft YouTube video, right? Now, these circles around here, these are different audiences. So we have viewers of Apex videos, viewers of Counter-Strike videos, etc, etc. And what YouTube's going to do right off the bat when you post a video, especially if your channel doesn't have very much data, is it's going to try promoting it to a bunch of different audiences that it thinks might like your video. So for example, it might test promoting it out to a small segment of the Apex viewers niche. But because these people are Apex viewers, not Minecraft viewers, they're not going to be interested in this video and so they're not going to click on it or watch it. The algorithm might do the same thing to CSGO viewers, promote to a small portion of them, but again, Counter-Strike Global Offensive is very different to Minecraft and so dedicated viewers of CSGO videos probably aren't going to watch your Minecraft video. And it's going to do the same thing to all of these other niches and they're not going to work out because they're not Minecraft viewers until it promotes your Minecraft video to a small segment of the Minecraft viewers niche. Now, I do want to say that this is a very oversimplified metaphorical way of understanding how the algorithm works. But if you act as if this is exactly how the algorithm works, it's going to help you get a lot more views and I'll show you why in a second. So anyway, it's going to promote your Minecraft video, test it with a small section of the Minecraft viewers audience. Now, these Minecraft viewers, remember, want to watch Minecraft videos. And so assuming your Minecraft video is good, this little segment is going to resonate very positively with your Minecraft video. They're going to, a bunch of them are going to watch it. YouTube's going to be like, oh, we're onto something here. And it's going to promote that Minecraft video of yours to maybe a larger segment of this audience and a larger segment and a larger segment until it promotes this video to the entire segment of Minecraft viewers. And if you're lucky, well, not lucky, but if you've created a good tile, thumbnail video, etc., they're all going to click on and watch this Minecraft video of yours. And it's going to get a bunch of views. Now, let's say we take this Minecraft video and because it was so successful, you create a, another Minecraft video. Now, the algorithm is going to do maybe a similar thing to what it did before, but it's going to promote and test with even smaller portions of these other audiences because it was unsuccessful with them in the beginning with this video here. So it promotes to a small portion of this audience and a smaller portion of this audience and a smaller portion of this audience. Again, they don't resonate because this is another Minecraft video that you've just posted here, right? But then when it comes back to the trusty Minecraft viewers audience and promotes to them, they resonate very positively with this video. YouTube continues to scale this video up within this niche until all of them have had this video promoted to them. Now, again, this isn't exactly how the algorithm works, but this is a really good way to think about it. So we come up here and guess what? You post another Minecraft video. And now at this point, the algorithm is starting to learn. It's figuring out, hey, this channel, whenever it posts a video, seems to resonate with Minecraft viewers. And so what it's going to do is it's going to promote this video to the Minecraft viewers audience. And because you've posted yet another Minecraft video, again, this audience reacts positively to this video 
click on it, watch it, everything is right with the world. And with every video you post, you start getting more and more views. But this is where a lot of small creators stuff up. They get bored and they post a different video. For example, instead of a Minecraft video, they post a Fortnite video. Now the algorithm, remember, thinks that this channel is actually a Minecraft channel based on the profile, the success and the data it's built up on this channel in the past. So what it does is it promotes your Fortnite video right off the bat to these Minecraft viewers. But we have a problem. These Minecraft viewers aren't interested in Fortnite. They want to watch Minecraft videos. And so they don't react positively to this Fortnite video. YouTube never ends up finding the right audience for this video and instead it just assumes, oh, this must be a bad video because this audience who normally click on all the videos from this channel and not clicking on or watching this video. And so that video must just not be very good. Now you and I with our evolved brains can look at this situation and tell, hey, maybe this Fortnite video actually is a good video. The problem is it's just being promoted to the wrong audience. It doesn't matter how good of a Fortnite video you make, if that video gets promoted to people who just don't wanna watch Fortnite videos, you're kind of screwed. I don't care how much the algorithm plugs Peppa Pig videos to me, I'm not gonna click on them just because I'm not interested in those videos. At least that's what I want you to think. And so I know this is a bit complicated, but this is the algorithm secret I want you to understand. Because what a lot of you guys are doing right now is you have videos on your channels that appeal to multiple different audiences, meaning the algorithm is never able to build up a profile of who your viewers are. And so you're stuck in this endless learning cycle where all of your videos just get a very small amount of views and the algorithm has absolutely no idea who to send them to. So to avoid this mistake, and this is something I constantly drum into my students, create videos for a specific niche. And the way I define that, the question to ask yourself is, would the type of audience who click on this video also want to click on all of the rest of the videos on my channel. So in this particular circumstance, our Fortnite video doesn't pass this litmus test because Fortnite viewers will be far less likely to watch all the other Minecraft videos on this channel. Vice versa, Minecraft viewers who click on these videos probably aren't going to watch our Fortnite video. So this channel fails our niche test, which means it's probably gonna grow way slower or just not grow at all. So if you design your channel strategy in a way that it's gonna be working with the algorithm and feeding the algorithm good data, you're gonna be way ahead of almost everyone else. But just because you have a common through line across all of the content on your channel doesn't necessarily mean you're going to get views because if your videos themselves aren't very good, then obviously no one is going to want to click on, watch or send positive signals to the algorithm about any of them in the first place. And that's why I want to share this next algorithm secret with you. And it revolves around a principle called the peak end rule. So when we look into what YouTube themselves actually say about how to get their algorithm to give me more views, they say that YouTubers should focus on three main buckets. First is appeal, second is engagement, third is satisfaction. Now this is actually very good advice from YouTube, but as with most of YouTube's advice, it's so vague and watered down that it's kind of not useful. So let me explain to you what YouTube is saying here. Basically, the first step is you need a video that is going to appeal to your audience. By appeal, YouTube looks at whether or not viewers, once served your video, are going to find it appealing enough to actually want to click on it. The second bucket is engagement. It's all well and good if someone clicks on a video, but if they click on it and leave it immediately, not a very good sign. The third category though is satisfaction. This is something that doesn't get talked about very much because it's sort of hard to understand and little known. So what YouTube wants is for people to keep coming back to the YouTube platform. And even if someone creates engaging content, so they get viewers to watch that video all the way to the end, that doesn't necessarily mean that those viewers were satisfied with that piece of content. I'm sure you've been in a situation where you've clicked on a video, watched it all the way to the end and thought, um, it's the biggest piece of dog shit. Or maybe you were just completely tricked. You're expecting a big payoff at the end of that video and that big payoff never came or maybe it was just super underwhelming. And that's really bad in YouTube's eyes because it makes you less likely to click on another video to spend more time on YouTube. And when you spend less time watching videos on YouTube, YouTube makes less money. So what the YouTube recommendation system does is analyze a bunch of signals to figure out whether or not people were actually satisfied with the video they just watched. So one of the things YouTube does to learn how satisfied viewers are with particular videos is it periodically shows viewers surveys after watching a certain video that asks them how they feel about the video they just watched. YouTube then uses the data from those surveys to train predictive models to identify which videos are the most satisfying. 
Now, you might think, well, I hardly ever see these surveys, Marcus, so they must not have that big of an impact. Well, the thing is, because of collaborative filtering, another concept we talked a bit about earlier, YouTube might only show these surveys to one out of every 100 or one out of every 10,000 or 100,000. I don't know what the number actually is. But then based on that one viewer's response, it's going to find all the other people who've watched this video who have similar viewing habits and tastes to that one viewer who filled out the survey. And that one survey response from that one viewer is basically gonna be used to represent the sentiment for all of these other viewers, almost as if they filled out that exact same survey. So if you can get viewers to remember your content very favorably, when those surveys pop up, they're going to be more likely to give you a higher rating, which means YouTube's gonna view your content as more satisfying, which means it's gonna to wanna to promote it more. Bit complicated, but I hope that makes sense. So the big question is, how can we get people to remember our content more favorably? That's where the peak end rule comes in. The peak end rule states that essentially, how people feel about something like your video will be defined by the peak of the video. So the single most engaging emotion inducing moment from that video and the end of that video i.e. how that video ended. And the part where a lot of YouTubers screw this up is the end bit. So guys, that's the end of my video. Thanks so much for watching. If you enjoyed, please leave a like down below and leave a comment letting me know what videos you want to see next. Basically, you're killing your end, which means people are going to remember your video less favorably. Giving you less positive survey ratings, meaning the algorithm sends you less views. But what you want to do is have some sort of ramp of energy or emotion right at the end of your video. Now I can use the cliche example that everyone likes to throw around, including myself, which is Mr. Beast. Look at how abruptly he ends his videos after just casually giving away like a million dollars. So when that audience satisfaction survey shows up or when they're promoted another Mr. Beast video, those viewers are still sort of riding the high of the last few seconds of the video they just watched. And they're more likely to give a favorable rating or click on another Mr. Beast video. And I know this is hard to do. I fail at this in my own videos all the time, but if you can engineer this into the end of your video, based on what I've analyzed, you're gonna start seeing better results. But in order for this to actually work, obviously you need your viewers to actually get to the end of your video. And for people to get to the end of your video, you need a good average view duration. Hence the next algorithm secret, the average view duration lie. Well, it's not quite that your average view duration analytics lie to you, but often we don't have the context that we need to when analyzing our average view duration, which is how long our viewers watch our video for, to draw good meaningful conclusions from it. Let me give you an example. Let's say you have a small channel you're not big, but you have a little bit of an audience growing and you post a video like my story, how I started my YouTube channel. Now, after you post that video, you go into your analytics, you scroll down to your audience retention graph and you see the retention is really good. And you're like, wow, people really like this video. I should create more story-based content about my life. Now, sometimes that might be the case. What's more likely to be the case is that particular video is only going to be clicked on by people who are interested enough in you to care about your story story. And that type of viewer is going to be more likely to watch your video all the way to the end than say a more casual viewer who's not even going to click on your video in the first place because your story doesn't interest them. So essentially you're getting a very small group of people who really care about you to click on your video. They watch it all the way to the end. They inflate your analytics to make it look like this is the best video you've ever created. But the video doesn't get very many views because as soon as YouTube tests promoting it with a small section of other broader audiences, they show absolutely no interest. And so YouTube just like cuts off the promotion. And so my overall advice to you here is not to completely ignore your analytics, but it's to bear in mind the context of them. So the ultimate metric you should keep coming back to is your views. Even if you got a bad click through rate, if that video is getting a lot of views, it means you're doing something right. So analyze that video, figure out what it is about that video that people are liking and apply it to all of your future videos. But for some people, this brings up the question, what analytics in my YouTube dashboard can I trust? Well, beyond things like views and impressions, a metric YouTube puts a lot of focus on is your watch time hours. Watch hours are almost a combination of the three big elements we talked about earlier, appeal, engagement, and satisfaction. And here's why. You can have a video that retains a lot of people, but the video is only being watched by nine people because it's not very appealing to anyone. On the other hand, you could have a really appealing video, great title, great thumbnail, great idea, but when people click onto it, they don't engage, aka watch it for very long, and that's also a bad thing. But in order to get watch time hours, people have to actually click on the video, and they also need to watch it for a certain length of time to actually contribute seconds, minutes, maybe even hours towards that watch time hours stat. And this is why YouTube are constantly talking about and showing you watch hours analytics when you click to your YouTube analytics dashboard. It's YouTube sort of hinting to you like, hey, we want you to focus on this. It's even so important that the new YouTube AB thumbnail testing tool that's going to be released sometime next year decides the best thumbnail for a video, not based on click-through rate, not based on views, 
but based on watch hours. So if you can create longer videos without making them boring and adding more filler content, sometimes this gives you the opportunity to get more watch hours per viewer, which can sometimes lead to you getting more views. And you can see a lot of popular creators, Mr. Beast, Ryan Trahan, Eric, etc., etc. Compare their video lengths nowadays to what they were a couple of years ago or when they first started. You'll see they're gradually making their videos longer and longer and longer. And this is also true with YouTube Shorts. For example, a study I covered in one of my previous videos analyzed 5,400 different YouTube Shorts and something they found was that on average, the Shorts that got the most views tended to be the longest ones. Now sure, there are a bunch of other important factors obviously, but let's take two really good Shorts. The only difference between them is that one's 30 seconds and one's one minute. And on average, they both get viewers to watch the Short all the way to the end. According to this study, the Short that is one minute in length is probably gonna get more watch hours and perform better. Now I've talked a bunch about retention and watch hours. And so I think it's only fair that we talk a little bit about the appeal equation, which is making clickable content. And I think this is really critical because while obviously it's important that we engage and satisfy our viewers, if people don't click in the first place, you don't even have the opportunity to engage or satisfy your viewers. There seems to be this clickableness versus retention myth going around that says, if you just create great videos, viewers are gonna come. And I don't think this mentality is correct. In fact, based on what I'm seeing on my channels, but also across my thousands of students' channels, it's that your packaging, which is your title and thumbnail, so how you package your video, actually plays a bigger role in your video getting views initially than the quality of your video. So what I mean by that is if you have a great video, highly engaging, keeps people watching all the way to the end, but you have a pretty average title and thumbnail, that video is not going to perform as well as another video that has a great title and thumbnail, but kind of more average video content. And I know that's very controversial to say, I'm open to other data, but it's just what I'm seeing right now. And so the actionable insight you should take away here is if like most people, you're spending 90% of your efforts on actually creating your video and then 10% of your efforts on the title and thumbnail, you should probably be spending somewhere more like 30 or 40% of your efforts just on coming up with a really cracking idea and great packaging. So a super enticing title and thumbnail. And then the remaining percentage of your efforts actually on your video. And after trying that for a bit, I would be very surprised if you're not getting more views than you currently are now. Now, speaking of packaging, a lot of people associate packaging with your click-through rate, which is the percentage of people who click on your video after they see it listed on YouTube. So for example, if my video is pushed out to 10 viewers and out of those viewers, one of them actually clicks on my video, I will have a 10% click-through rate because the number one is 10% of 10. But as you're probably gathering from this video, click-through rate is also not a metric you can just take on face value. Sometimes you can actually get more views with a lower click-through rate than you would with a higher click-through rate. And so before you go spending all this extra time on your titles and thumbnails, you should probably learn how to gauge the performance of your titles and thumbnails and how to accurately understand what click-through rate is and how it works. So I'll link a video on screen where I go over that in a lot more detail because I've been recording for one hour and three minutes right now and uh, I kind of want to go to bed right now. So click on that video, I'll explain it all there.